Hello, everybody. Welcome to this third talk in the series Still Learning Live. Uh, it's great to have you all here. Sorry, those of you who are joining live, there was a little blip at the beginning with our technology, but it's lovely to have you all here. Um, and as the title suggests, this is a theme where we're looking at learning and we're doing this through conversations with creative practitioners from a range of different disciplines. Um, and one of the things that for me is so exciting about this is it gives us a chance to talk in conversation with individuals about what they're learning, how they've got to where they are, what learning they would want to share with you, with us, um, and to unpack something about what their career and their daily work involves, partly through the conversation and through the questions that we want you to ask. So please do get involved and add questions through the chat um, and I'll get to put them to tonight's speaker. So our previous two conversations have been with a creative director, Lydia Pang, a creative strategist, Tamrat Amaize. And tonight I'm really delighted that we're gonna be talking with Nick Parker, who is a writer, a copywriter, a writer of copy. We're gonna unpack all of this in a minute with Nick. Um, and there's an opportunity for us to try and get underneath well, the question that I have, the burning question I have is what a writer does day to day. I really want to understand what it is that Nick's practice involves. So this is an opportunity for us to find out all about that and about the learning that Nick Parker has been engaged in. So Nick, a really warm welcome to you. Lovely to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great. Now, the conversation has a structure to it for those of you who are new to this and, and so that Nick is aware as well. We're going to spend some time looking back. So looking back at the learning journey that has got Nick to where he is today. And then we're going to talk about where Nick is now and what the projects are or the processes that, that Nick's engaged in. And that hopefully will give us an opportunity to really explore this idea of, of what the practice of writing is. And then we're going to, in the final section, look outwards and look beyond. So it's looking beyond the practice of writing and we're gonna be really curious to learn, Nick, about where your learning comes from um, and any learning resources you might want to suggest that those of us who are listening tonight could go away and look at to continue learning ourselves. Um, so let's begin. I'd like to ask, to start off with, what your learning journey has been. What did you study and where did you study to become a writer? Oh, that is a very good question. Um, so I studied uh, English and philosophy at university, but I don't think I did that. I'm just, I'm pausing because I think, I don't think I did that to be a writer. Like, I think I was always a writer. Um, <laughs> like I remember when I was in like junior school, I used to make comics and get my dad to photocopy them at his work and sell them around the school. And it like <laughs> I realised years later, I basically just got a job doing what I did when I was about nine. Um, so I did. I went to went to a big comprehensive school. Um, I was the first person from my family to go to university. I went and did English and philosophy. Largely because, looking back, I came from I came from a family where nobody talked about anything. Like it was very like a very buttoned up family. We didn't talk about emotions or ideas or politics or money or having opinions or anything. Um, but that's really in me. I like I'm like really curious about ideas, um, and so I sort of shot out of home to read books and talk about ideas at university. And that sort of that sort of set me off. Um, and and you talked does that about your question. <laughs> yeah, I think it does. I mean, and it's interesting to know that you did. I, I take it you went to university then to study. Um, did you say philosophy? English and philosophy, English literature, English and philosophy. And philosophy. Yeah. yeah, and and those are subjects that perhaps 
don't immediately lend themselves to a particular career or kind of trajectory. So how did you then, when you, when you left university, how did you start a kind of a career in writing? And you, it was interesting that you say you've always kind of, you know, from the comics and the things that you, that you did as a, as a child, it sounds like writing was always part of kind of how you thought and made sense of the world. But I, for me, yeah. there's always that thing about how, how, when you graduate, when you leave the comfort in a way, the security of education, did you decide you were going to be a writer? What was the first step that you took? So there's probably two versions of this story. There's the version where I look back and retrospectively make sense of it. Uh, but I think the truth was I had no idea what I was doing. Um, in the absence of anything better to do, I moved to London. Um, and that, that seemed like the most proactive thing I could do um, because I was sort of, I didn't even know I really wanted to be a writer, I guess. I didn't sort of didn't believe I could make a living at it. I got a job in a bookshop. Um, in fact, I spent two and a half years in bookshops, um, which was a sort of great community of people who weren't really working in bookshops. They were sort of doing other things. Um, I used to uh, write jokes for the radio. There was a Radio 4 program called Weekending, where you could just, anyone could rock up at the writer's room, write one line of jokes and sort of send them in. Um, so I used to do that a bit. I'd send off, uh, I drew, drew cartoons. Um, so the first thing I was paid to write was for Viz magazine. Um, so, oh, look there, in fact, is a, a slide of Viz magazine. Um, and there's a little bit of a connection here, I guess. This thing, the green form, which you might be seeing on your screen now. Uh, uh, so <laughs> when I drew a cartoon for Viz, I sent it off. Before they'll pay you, you have to sign the sort of terms and conditions thing, which is called the green form, which is white. And if, it's got this little bit of copy on it that says, if you agree to the offer below, please sign one copy of the agreement and return it to us at the address above. Keep the other in a safe place for your own reference. If you're registered for VAT, please enclose a VAT invoice when returning the form. If you aren't, you don't want to be, I can tell you, it's a bigger pain in the ass than piles. <laughs> um, and I, like the reason I'm showing this, I had this moment of like, oh God, that's very funny. That's very viz, you know, rude daft comic even their legal release form has this sort of weird, like funny bit of viz writing on it. I was also thinking, are they allowed to do this? Cause this is like, you know, a legal document. And a little thing in my brain was like, that'd be a fun job, wouldn't it? Like doing the weird words um, that go around all of this other stuff. And so obviously, you know, if we jump forward 25 years, this is essentially still what I do is help brands think about getting their personality into all of the language uh, that they use. But that sort of planted a little seed back then. But to, to go back to your question, didn't really know what I was doing, stumbling around in bookshops, um, doing bits of writing, but you know, only making tiny little bits of money here and there. My girlfriend at the time, now wife, was studying graphic design uh, at Goldsmiths. So uh, in the flat, we had an Apple Mac, which, you know, at the time, what, what was this like 93 it was like there were like 300 apple macs in the country and they were all they were super expensive and all owned by graphic designers um and so i in the evening it occurs to me this is a learning journey question right so um my breakthrough was teaching myself to learn quark express because this computer was in the flat uh, there it is <laughs> like, incredibly high-tech bit of equipment taught myself to use Quark Express. And from that was just like, oh, I'd sort of started hustling my way into publishing, essentially. Um, I say hustling. Uh, my girlfriend had a job at the week, at, the, at a newspaper at the weekend, and she uh, put me up for a, a, an overnight slot on a Friday night. Uh, laying out classified ads for New Nation newspaper, which was like the sort of lowest possible desktop publishing work you could get. And sort of as the ad guys were desperately selling the final ads on a Friday night so they could go home and they would sell them off cheaper and cheaper to sort of lower rent and lower rent clients who would then come in, like the local curry house would come in with its logo on a beer mat and hand that over. And I'd have to 
scan it in, write the ad, lay it out and knock these things out really quickly. So through this weird thing of being able to use desktop publishing software, not being a designer, but knowing which buttons to press, and then having this sort of conveyor belt of suddenly having to take ads, write copy, bang these things out really quickly. I got this little training in, um, I don't know what you'd call it really, like just sort of a, a mix of copywriting and marketing and design. And, and that sort of started me off then. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you, Rebecca. You've gone silent. Oh, can you hear me now? Thank oh, there you. we go. That's better. Yes. Thank you. It, that's really interesting, Nick. And it also sounds to me like um, th there's something about the, the the means of writing, you know, the, the tools that you use and the formats being part of that that early kind of training or understanding of how language or writing fits, like where it sits, its context. Um, and it made me think when you showed that that green card um, uh, example about tone of voice, and I know this is something that's very close to your heart in what you do now in relation to brands, but I wonder then, could I ask, when did you discover your, your voice? in a way, you know, you were doing this and you were, you were learning something about the craft, it sounds like, but at what point did you feel that you found your voice? God, not for a long time. So I don't think I even realized then that I was being a writer, certainly not being a copywriter. Um, I was just doing this job, like this desktop publishing job. And then from there, I did a similar thing for a magazine called The Oldie. Um, sort of working in the production and gradually moving over to the writing. And it was probably there. So the old is a sort of magic magazine in a way. It's sort of, uh, it was edited by Richard, founded and edited by Richard Ingrams, who's one of the founding editors of Private Eye. And it was a sort of staunchly, curmudgeonly, deliberately unfashionable magazine for essentially grumpy old people, um, sort of knowingly grumpy old people. Um, and there was a particular column called modern life there was a pair of columns one called modern life one called olden life and olden life would be like what was some nostalgic thing in camp coffee or crystal radios a modern life would be take some particular thing from contemporary culture and try and explain it to people who were who wanted to be grumpy about it so like what you know what is bluetooth or what is a chicken ability or what is life coaching and I fell into writing those and I think it was from that really so that was like taking an aspect of modern culture uh, explaining it to people in a way that was meant to be taking the piss but actually I just really like I was interested in the stuff um, making it funny and then that so I sort of like accumulated quite a lot of those over two or three years and uh, the oldie published those as a book. Off the back of that, a publisher got in touch with me at the oldie and said, um, a publisher called Prion, and said, uh, we really like your style, um, which I was like, oh, wow, I've got a style. I hadn't sort of realised. Uh, would you like to write a book about why everyone is obsessed with the Irish and Ireland? Um, and I thought this was amazing. Like a publisher turns up and asks you to write a book. And I was really like, I, I'd love to, but I've only ever visited Dublin once and I have no thoughts or opinions on why anyone is interested in um, the Irish and Ireland. This was particularly like when St. Patrick's Day was becoming like a big global celebration. I said, but I do, I do think it'd be funny to write a book about toast. Maybe we could do that instead. Um, and so I wrote a proposal. This was at the time when, uh, if you remember, there was books like um, Longitude and cod and salt so they were like uh like social and cultural histories based around a specific artifact um and i thought it'd be funny if there was a book that did the same thing with toast um as a sort of because toast is like this it's private food right isn't it like everyone everyone has a really specific um ideas about how their toast should be cooked but we never talk about it because you just make it for yourself um so it's, it was probably that it was writing writing those columns then writing that funny book it was like oh this is me that's my voice 
So there was also something you said there, which has cropped up in some of the other conversations that I've had with with our earlier speakers around learning, which was that it's when somebody else recognizes or tells you you have a style or recognizes a particular kind of attribute or ability that it really feels real and that there's a moment of being able to kind of get that recognition or reinforcement. Um, and I wonder, is there anything that you could share with our audience kind of looking back at that moment for you about how, in a way, how to develop that, that that confidence or how to put your writing out there, you know, to get that recognition? That's a really good question. I mean, at the time, I wasn't confident at all. Um, I mm. think the thing, the thing that I did repeatedly was a mix of being curious. Like, it seems obvious now that I taught myself to use Quark Express and then use that to get my foot in the door in publishing, but actually it wasn't obvious that I should go like, what's that weird bit of software you're using, Sam? And like, can I have a go? Like, so there's a thing there about that. What's this thing outside of my immediate world? You know, other writers were just getting on with writing. I was like learning software. of sort of curiosity about what's adjacent to your world. I think that really helps you find things that other people aren't doing. Um, and then I just had this sort of weird thing of like, be helpful. Like the way that I put myself out there wasn't, I didn't ever really feel like I was self promoting or sort of pushing my stuff. You know, I got this job at a magazine and then I noticed there was this column that um, they were perpetually desperate to fill at the last minute. So I was like, oh, well, you know, I, I could do that. <laughs> it was very like a mix of being very uncalculated. I wasn't at all pushy there was no plan um and yet that thing of like oh that would be helpful to them and then i noticed a thing um in retrospect of when the opportunity arises to repeat a craft thing over and over again so like i wrote a load of those columns in a really short space of time and then i edited a section called the diary every month for about three years and then when i got a job in an agency later on i delivered the what was essentially the same or similar workshop every day for two or three years. Um, I've just like, then you sort of really hone a craft. And I, in retrospect, I feel really lucky to have found those. It's like, you know, the Beatles in Hamburg, they get to go and play the same set three times a day, six hours a day. Um, and just really embeds a skill. I feel really lucky as a writer to have, have done that. I love that. And I love that partly because I think there's perhaps a, an impression that uh, a writer and any kind of creative actually waits for a moment of inspiration. You know, the inspiration is the fuel, but actually what you're saying is that the honing of the skill through through doing it again and again and again is partly what, what generates confidence, but also it generates the body of work, right? You then have, yeah. you have things in front of you to be able to put in front of people or to show and 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 yeah the honing of the craft i like so can we move yeah. on to talking about a bit more of what you're what you're currently doing so how you've got to where you are right now and and kind of what your what your day-to-day -day life is like as a writer now so the the learning bit of this is so my move from publishing to the sort of brand and agency and tone of voice work I do now was also inspired by a learning thing. My girlfriend, Sam, who had the Apple Mac, uh, became my wife. We got married and she was she had been a graphic designer and then retrained as a horse whisperer. Right. So this is relevant. Horse that's whispering real is behavioral job. Psych yeah, so it's a real job. Horse whispering is behavioral psychology uh, for horses and horses are and the reason it's the reason it's called whispering is because horses are prey animals. They're not predators. All the other animals that we associate with, like cats and dogs, respond to rewards and praise and stuff in the same way. Horses are different. Um, so no, this is sort of behavioral psychology. So like we would spend all our evenings talking about behavioral psychology. And I was like, that's really cool. I think I want to do a job like that, but with writing. So that's sort of how I got. I ended up leaving publishing and working for this agency called The Writer as a writing trainer, because it just seemed that, you know, 
training people and helping people to write, particularly non-professional writers, was just like a way to sort of get stuck into the psychology of, you know, this big messy skill. Um, so where are we? So that's, that's sort of how I made the leap from publishing to sort of creative workshops and consultancy and strategy stuff. And a lot of the work I do now is helping brands find a voice. So my agency is called That Explains Things. And I think there's probably two aspects to it. There is like finding a voice for your brand uh, and explaining things. So in a way, I don't, I don't really think of myself as a copywriter. I just think of myself as a writer. So I write lots of different things. And part of the reason I don't think it was as copy so much is that um, a lot of copy tends to be focused on, you know, the marketing and the selling and the persuading side of things. A lot of the stuff I end up writing is just about explaining stuff, explaining difficult ideas or abstract concepts and making things clear. And that's been sort of my way of working with a lot of brands. Um, to talk about the brand stuff then. So I guess sort of 10, 12 years ago, the idea of tone of voice was quite weird and niche still. If you talked about the idea of tone of voice to most people, the brand they would think of was Innocent Drinks, who have you know, a particularly cutesy and chatty style that did sort of um, mean that most brands for years and years and years were like, oh, can you make us sound more like Innocent Drinks, even if it was wildly inappropriate thing to do. Um, now, you know, most good, like most good brands have a, like a clear idea that their brand should also be, you know, there's the visual stuff and there's the, you know, the photography style. And then also the way you write and the voice you use should all be super consistent as well. Um, and just, there's loads more opportunity for lots of fun and interesting, distinctive voices. And also, um, lots of writing that used to be felt as like sort of second class business writing you know the stuff that goes on behind the scenes uh, your terms and conditions or your small print or all of the sort of more functional stuff that's now sort of all up for grabs as well because that's all just really consistently part of the experience there's more and more stuff goes digital and everything is online as well like everything is part of the experience so i really like that because um I'm just interested in the idea of voice generally is super interesting. Um, as a, a writer, as from a sort of copywriting point of view, I guess it means you're having like interesting and more strategic big picture conversations with clients because, you know, the idea of voice is closer to the idea of brand than it is to just like, oh, we need some SEO pages for our website. Um, and this is just a really interesting thing to play with. I mean, for me, it, it's so interesting that this is a, a relatively new area, but it is it is this kind of this really um, it's now such a prominent thing, the idea of a tone of voice. And I'm sure that lots of people kind of listening to this will recognize that the idea that a brand has a tone of voice and that most of us, if we have a website, you know, we're looking to find that tone of voice. How, how do you, how do you find your clients? Do they find you? Do you identify people that you want to work with? How, how does that work? <laughs> if only I was that strategic. Um, no, they tend to find me. They tend to find me. I've worked in the past with, uh, like partnered with agencies. So sometimes that brings me clients, particularly bigger clients who I, you know, probably wouldn't come to me, definitely wouldn't come to me direct. Um, uh, so that's people like booking.com and Tesco, in fact, no booking.com did come to me direct. Um, but mostly, yeah, it's just people sort of get to know, have heard of me and come to me. This is, I'm incredibly lucky. <laughs> it's really, um, yeah. So I, with, there's a and question is, that's come in. Sorry, go on, Nick. No, I was just going to say, and your thing about, you know, it is, it is still a, it's just crossed over the idea of tone of voice, I think, from being something that was sort of relatively new to being something that all of a sudden everyone gets, you know, working brand, everyone gets tone of voice. Um, and it's an interesting moment, I think. So I, when I started my own agency, I made this product, which is called Voicebox, which sort of came about because there's a, a way of trying to 
codify some thinking on tone of voice because I was really surprised that um, like as I sort of joined the kind of freelance community, if you like, that lots, it turned out lots of freelance copywriters did still think of tone of voice as quite a dark art. There's no sort of, there was no agreed process for doing it or sort of model for how to approach it. So I just thought that would be interesting. So voice box is a way of, is me saying, you know, I think there are, I'm claiming there are 11 primary voices, like 11 sort of voice archetypes. Um, that you can use to mix and match and sort of create brands tone of voice. Obviously, there aren't 11 voices in the world, um, but it helps to think that there are. Um, just because it felt like it would be like the, the sort of industry, if you like, needed a bit of coherent thinking, it would be useful to have a model, even if people wildly disagree with it, to sort of move the thinking on from just like either you're sort of funny or you're formal, which was sort of pretty much still where things were until quite recently. That's Sorry, great. You tell, you. you've got a question come in. Yeah, and I think you've partly answered it, actually. So this is from Julia, who is a fellow writer, she says. Um, and her kind of question or point was around the struggle in sometimes proving to clients and colleagues um, that I think that tone of voice matters. I think that's what you mean, Julia, when crafting a strong brand and holistic experience. And she asked about whether you encounter that struggle and then what techniques you use. And I'm guessing that voice box is one of the one of the kind of techniques that you've developed as a result of that. But but how do, how do you persuade clients that this matters? Um. It's a really good question. I think there's a few things going on. Um, firstly, is just like just showing people really good work and helping them connect with like one of the weird things about writing is how differently we think about it when we're the writer to when we're the reader or the audience. You know, you write, you write something that you think is going to be incredibly persuasive. It turns out you've written something incredibly long winded and formal because you want it to sound professional which you know full well that if you received that you'd think god this is dull and long-winded and i'm not reading it it's not professional at all um so there's just a sort of process of showing people good voice work and reminding them that when they go oh my god that's great like that matters like that, that's really important feedback because tone of voice is one of those things it's not so measurable in the same way that you know other you know landing pages and seo and all of that stuff is incredibly in the numbers um getting customers perspectives a surprising amount of tone of voice projects that i have done have been triggered by clients customers giving them bad feedback uh, a brilliant bit of feedback from a professional services company i worked with once whose whose clients have said if you keep writing us reports that are this long and difficult we'll start charging you to read them and like, you know, that is essentially sort your writing out. Um, or another a tech client whose clients had started telling them, um, uh, we love your technology, but we can't understand a word you say. Like, so I think it's just something about, you know, often connecting with the people who it really matters for. And then just showing them what it can look like. Um, I do think there's an interesting difference between, often between writing and design. Like I notice when I work with agencies, that, um, you know, a visual like strategy, brand strategy or design agency, we're really happy to do like three really in-depth routes for the visual stuff, you know, radically different. Um, and then one tone of voice. And a few paragraphs. And just so like just treating the treating the process as seriously with voice as you would with the design and really taking the time to explore it and then test it and get feedback. Um, that's great. Like, I've got a couple of, sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> I was just going to say, and the other thing is, is just to test it. Like just take the old copy, the new copy, show it to people, see which one they prefer or which one they click on, like never fails. So in a minute, I definitely like to unpack that a bit more. Cause I think we're beginning to get to some of the, the kind of the, the tricks of the trade in a way, the things that, that are, are tools and, 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 and things to use. But I'm going to go to a couple more questions. Um, Christina writes about whether there are tips 
for getting started as a copywriter. Um, and she says, I know there's not one single path, but is there a good plan of action for putting together a portfolio? So I guess, are there, is there some key kind of content or anything that you think is a, is a really useful practical tip that you could give Christina? I wish I could be super helpful. Um, I've ne um, so when I, when I used to work at the agency, the writer, so I was often receiving CVs and portfolios and work. Um, A, it's surprising how often, like 95% of copywriters stuff, uh, the CV was incredibly dull and formal and just like, you know, like they were applying for a job in project management. Like you're a writer, make your CV well written and interesting. Uh, I do think maybe this is my preference though, like there's a tendency to want to showcase like clever copy, like ad lines and those sorts of selling lines. That is fine, but also showing the ability to be able to flex a voice or explain a difficult idea or, um, you know, those sort of, what other forms of writing that you can demonstrate that you do? Um, I mean, it, again, like I was at the writer probably 10 years ago, and even then it seemed unusual to me if a writer was hustling for a job who didn't have a blog or some form of writing online that was theirs that, you know, that was 10 years ago. It would seem even odder to me now that if you're, you know, if you say you're a professional writer, you don't have something that is yours that's out there in the world. You know, it doesn't have to be huge, but, you know. The barriers to publishing are zero so get stuff out there that's great thank you um and the, there's a really lovely question here from yash um and yash says you you got into writing naturally and gradually it sounds like um more or less starting at the age of nine so it was subconsciously developing which is something i really relate with yash says but they'd like to know if you've had the imposter feeling um or felt that you're kind of more than a writer or other than a writer? Um, I have all shades of imposter syndrome. So uh, <laughs> let's do a quick audit. So uh, first from my family to university. So I've had this whole thing about what are the middle class codes of these jobs? I don't really understand. I remember getting to university and everyone talking about their gap year. I was like, what's a gap year? Where have you all been? You're allowed to have a year off. <laughs> so I had a sort of whole imposter syndrome about this whole, like even like working in a middle class world. I have a imposter syndrome about never having worked in big agencies or the sort of ad industry, never having done that. Um, I came from a tiny literary magazine into um, a creative agency, never having been a copywriter, never having run a workshop, let alone a corporate workshop on writing. Um, so for a long time, I had a imposter syndrome about that. And for a long time, I didn't call myself a writer. Like that's only relatively recently. Yeah. Like, so like all layers of it all the time. I still get really nervous every time I run a workshop. I've run thousands of workshops. It never goes away. Like I there's also always think something I that's outside of your comfort zone. Exactly. And I happen to know that you and I are the same age, Nick. And I think there's something uh, about reaching nearly half a century and being able to kind of say, actually, it's all right to feel like you're an imposter and to kind of accept that I think a lot of people, a lot of the time have that feeling. And partly it's kind of recognizing that you're not the only person feeling imposter syndrome in a room. <laughs> that, that yeah, yeah. you know, that, that there is, and I think when you were talking about craft and practice, again, there is something about doing the writing, doing the work, which is in itself kind of helping kind of move away from being the imposter to being, to being the thing. Um, but I wonder, can I, can I just go back? Cause I don't think you've quite answered what your kind of day-to-day -day activity is as a writer. So I'm really interested in understand, understanding if you're doing a piece of writing and I'm, I'm guessing it would be different depending on whether you're doing something for yourself or for a client, but do you have conditions that you need to set to write? Do you have kind of tricks to help you get started? Do you have a, a type of process? It would be really interesting to learn a little bit more about that. Uh, yes and no. So 
I I deliberately don't have any kind of fixed process uh, because so I, you know I I've written stuff standing up on trains literally on the back of envelopes as well as you know sitting by the fireside with my laptop and a glass of red wine because i'm a little bit paranoid about the idea that if i if i have a sort of fixed set of conditions you know oh i can only write at my special writing desk with my special pencils um what happens if i don't have them so i'm slightly phobic about that about always trying to mix it up um there's a thing that i only discovered really late that um I can probably do about three good hours of proper focused creative work a day. And I think this is, I think this is pretty constant actually. Lots of writers talk about this. Um, but that those three hours uh, also necessitate doing something in the other bits of the day that feed that. So what you've got is a working day that is essentially the same as everyone else's half of it is going to be spent on the really focused writing half of it is going to be spent on something else um and you're constantly in the sort of thing about am i just procrastinating is this faffing around is this really helping um and it usually is like so that can be you know there's sort of there's all the other admin uh and stuff that goes along with running a business like it could be that or it could be going for a walk or going for coffee or having a meeting, or it could be reading a book, or it could be, you know, I am I have a sort of, you know, because I work for myself and nobody else sends me on training courses or, you know, corporate away days, I deliberately always plan learning stuff in, in a week, so that I've always got some of that to do as well. Um, but yeah, so it's a mix of probably about three hours of writing, three hours of doing something else, but never at the same time during the day. I'm a high performing introvert, so I'm desperate to be alone in my shed. This is my writing shed. <laughs> um, and nothing makes me calmer and happier than being here by myself. And then after about three days, I go absolutely stir crazy and have to get out. And I'll do a day of coming into London and having meetings and stuff. And then by the end of that day, I'm like, what am I doing? I need to be back in the shed, it's exhausting. <laughs> So when so, you just talked about learning things and spending some time learning things, what kind of things do you do you learn? You know, what is it that feeds your your creativity, your writing? So, like just the basic thing of reading every day. Um, I wrote a little book called On Reading, in fact, which was about the sort of, you know, we think a lot about what we read. But we tend not to think about how we read. And I realized I developed sort of little different reading habits over the years. And one of them was um, when I used to work in London, I'd read on the train 45 minutes every day out and coming back. Um, and then when I stopped working from going into London and stopped having to commute, um, I realized I really missed that. So I do like some days I'll do a reading commute. I'll deliberately spend the 45 minutes commuting time reading uh, before I get to work. Um, so it's like that. Um, I'm always trying to, like last year I taught myself origami. At the moment I'm having singing lessons. Uh, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine did um, a com ran a conference called Inexpert, where he, he uh, an artist called Steve Chapman, and he, uh, he thought, what would it be like to have a conference that's the opposite of TED, where everyone who talks is passionate about what they're talking about, but knows nothing about it. Everyone's an inexpert. And he hired me to be the um, musical director. So I learned the trumpet in about six weeks and uh, played the trumpet. Uh, obviously, really badly, but very enthusiastically. <laughs> so and like that, just like a lot of that, I sort of not some things in life I try to get good at and better at, uh, like writing and drawing. Some things I just think it's great to just enjoy the process of of learning for the sake of trying to figure out what the hell's going on and to with no and, prospect and of ever it, getting really good at it and what is it that's valuable about that because i agree i mean i love the challenge of learning things and i kind of like i like what my brain has to do to try and engage with something i don't know but kind of what what is it that's meaningful about that for you um 
Well, I think there's partly just that, isn't there? What happens in your brain when you're trying to grasp the fundamentals of a big skill? Like, why is like I can play the ukulele, I can play the guitar, but like a trumpet's got three buttons. How do you even get a noise out of it? I like, so you just get introduced to a whole new thing in the world. Um, also, I do th like, I happen to think, you know, if you're young and starting out, like one of the things you want in life is a bit of stability and certainty because everything is up in the air. By the time you're incredibly ancient, um, it's nice to be outside of your comfort zone and be reminded what it's like to not know things. Uh, or to be having to or to feel like a klutz or an idiot uh, it's just really valuable and, and and is there anything more that you could say about the relationship between that then and your writing i mean is there is there something that's that that you can articulate about that relationship it occurs to me that's a really good question so part of why part of my the way that i write is explaining things you know that's a big part of my job and it's part of my style you know what is the what is the unusual metaphor that will sum up this thing and i do think actually that the that process of learning a new thing that is unfamiliar and then having to explain it to myself um is essentially a writerly skill you know what's going on here how do i make this familiar how do i put this into words for myself a sort of maybe it's like part of that practice in a way mm. um, what's the that's, that's the em really forster nice. thing isn't it you know how do i know what i think until i see what i say yeah that's really nice are, are there other writerly skills that you could share oh god there must be loads <laughs> <laughs> i should have a coherent answer to this shouldn't i um <laughs> Well, maybe it's an unfair question, but um, it's a lovely phrase that writerly skill and thinking about, you know, I was trying to think what what what, what other skills might there be that are particularly writerly? Okay, yes. So I'll answer it in this way. One of the things that you get very good at as a copywriter or if you're, you know, brand and marketing writing, that sort of professional writing is selling things, selling an idea, persuading other people, you know, finding the spin or the angle. Um, a very good counterbalance to that is uh, writing completely honestly, just like remembering, connecting with what it's like to authentically talk about what you really think and feel. Um, and to, it's, you know, a, as we talked about, the reason my company is called That Explains Things is a, like a lot of the time, professionally, it's more effective not to try and sell a thing, but just explain it. Um, so there's that, like daily journaling, all, all the most productive and creative periods of my life, I've been doing the Julia Cameron in morning pages, you know, writing three pages of journal every morning. It is no coincidence that when you're doing that, you are also creative in lots of other ways. Um, I'd also combine that with, um, the American poet William Stafford's advice for uh, writer's block. <laughs> when he was asked, what does he do about writer's block? He said, I lower my standards and keep going. And I think that as well <laughs> is just really good. If I think of the, you know, the, the amount of time I've wasted banging my head against a blank page because my idea of what I wanted to write was much bigger than my ability. I'm just like, just do the crap thing instead and keep moving. Yeah, the keeping going is one of those things that I don't think enough people talk about that, that actually, lots of people stop, they hit that, yeah. that kind of that metaphorical brick wall or the, the sense of not meeting one's own sense of what good would be and stop yes. and actually keeping going is so important. And that yeah. that makes me think of your, your relationship to productivity, Nick, because I know you have <laughs> You, you've got something to say about that and perhaps as we move into the final kind of section about advice that you might share and kind of looking out beyond beyond the practice of writing maybe we could start by talking about productivity so there, well, there's a slide isn't there with this this is my um, highly serious patented productivity system get the fuck on with it <laughs> and i made these cards um so i have this i have this practice i write down like any like anything useful or interesting or little quote or whatever it is, I write on a 
on a little artifact card um, and stick it by my desk. And I call these a card a day. And I've got like six boxes of these now, hundreds of the things. Um, and when I'm going through a sort of unproductive patch or procrastinating, um, I sort of pick one of these cards out at random and just take it as a bit of a sort of prompt. And what I noticed a while back is what I was actually doing was searching through the pack of cards for one particular card where I'd written on it, get the fuck on with it, uh, which is just <laughs> sort of me shouting at myself. And so I just thought it'd be a funny idea to make an entire pack of cards where every card says, get the fuck on with it. And that that is, that's the productivity system. And that is like, well, the irony is like, I had this idea ages ago. It took me years to make the bloody things. Um, and it really is like, it's the, so there's two things like this, the power of compounding, isn't it? Just like keeping going little and often, um, just pays dividends. You know, there's been no big transformative break or moment in my career. I've just, <laughs> just sort of kept going and incrementally, I sort of, uh, you know, astoundingly, have, you know, have this sort of nice, successful thing and I do work that I enjoy with clients that I like and suddenly people are asking me to come and talk about my career and if I have any advice to people it seems extraordinary <laughs> um, and sort of connected to that is the idea of just finishing stuff so like you know even those cards it's a funny idea it's even better once I make it and can stick it on my website and sell it um back when we you know were working at Waterstones um as a friend of mine spent five years of his life writing two novels that were then unpublished. And this seemed like it's just an incredible burden. So I started writing short stories because then you can finish them really quickly, get them out, send them to people, have them published. And just like finding formats where you can finish stuff and get it out in the world, I think feels really important and just helpful. That's lovely. And actually, we should maybe say that Nick and I worked, how many years ago did we work out it was? T over 20 years ago. Um, over 20 at years a ago at Waterstones in Richmond. At a Waterstones bookshop. Um, and we haven't stayed in touch. And actually, one of the things that was interesting was to kind of discover that you were doing this writing and this is an excuse, was an excuse to kind of find out more about that. And there was something that struck me when you said that you'd spent time working in bookshops, that, that it was a place of community for lots of people who had creative instincts, but were looking for what that next step into a career would be. And it was just a place where you knew you were going to meet like minded people kind of earning enough money to, to kind of just about keep the wolf from the door and having good conversations. Um, and I yeah. guess, you know, I think I think of working in a bookshop as also just having this amazing library around you the whole time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of segue from that into finding out what you're reading. I really want to know what are the things that you know you read every day. What, what type of things do you read? Do you have a do you have a kind of a menu of things that you read? Do you have more than one book on the go? How, yeah, tell us something about that. So I have, yeah, lots of books on the go. Uh, it's one, so the reason, part of the reason I ended up writing that little book on reading was from having conversations with people who, uh, if you're the sort of person who has to f finish every book you start, um, and then get stuck not reading for months and months, cause you've got a boring book that you can't put down. I was like, no, God, please. This is, this is a terrible waste of life and energy. Um, so I just have lots of books on the go. I start far more books than I finish. I've, I've recently, only just recently got into having a Kindle after years and years of only having paper books. And so that's given me a whole other thing. I'll read anything. So what am I reading at the moment? Um, I'm reading a book by, uh, a journalist called James Nestor about free diving and about wow. uh, the weird things, the weird connection between free diving and the oceans and our phys physiology. I got from that to that from a book uh, he'd written called Breath, about breath work and how to breathe. Like that's a great thing. Like, I think it's a really brilliant thing. Like one of the things I want to learn how to do uh, as an adult <laughs> is breathe properly. Um, <laughs> what else is going on? I've just reread, um, 
Oh, this is amazing book. Maggie Nelson's book, Blew It, which is a sort of memoir about how she fell in love with the colour blue, which is written in numbered paragraphs. I've just got a real weakness for things written in numbered paragraphs. Um, that, so that's nice. So can I, I just want to pick up on that for a moment because that idea of the structures of writing, you'd mentioned early on, I think a little bit, and then you showed us those cards and just thinking as somebody who's more of a visual person, and I would imagine kind of tuning in now, we've got a range of people who are both writers or use writing within design, but might be from design or advertising. Is there something about the relationship between a format and what that does to how you how you write? So whether that's talking about paragraphs or giving yourself a space constraint or a structure constraint, it seems to me a very designerly way to write to give yourself a grid yeah. restrictions. Can you can you tell us something about that? It's interesting that, isn't it? And I wonder if it's less prevalent in some ways. So obviously, you know, having worked in print magazines, you are constrained by the page, you know, and as a as a as a print writer, you get to know what 700 words feels like, you know, could you do a 700 words on this or 300 words on that. Um, and in fact, I learned like my editing craft, I learned laying out pages at the oldie and writing my articles into the pages, as they would appear mm. on screen so i was sort of working with the constraint um my newsletter is written as um 14 numbered sections and it i felt i felt like i didn't find the voice of the newsletter until i found that format which i stole from a poem by sherman alexi called sonnet with bird where he sort of, he's a native american indian poet um and he was like, I'm just going to do the sonnet form in my own way. It's not going to be 14 lines. It's not going to have this rhyme. It's going to be 14 paragraphs. Um, yeah, I think that I find that the sort of creative constraint of any sort of format constraint is, is sort of interesting and inspiring, actually. Yeah, and, th and there's something, again, coming back to this craft of writing, I think about it as a making practice when you have when you have format, there's something kind of three dimensional about that, which in my in my brain kind of gets exciting. Um, yeah, so, that's really right. Yeah. Um, so I, I wonder, as we kind of close, are there, this is a bit of a corny question to ask a writer, but are there any pieces of advice that you would be sharing more broadly for the audience particularly around tone of voice, actually. I'm kind of thinking that it's a really valuable thing for anybody to feel confident in, to have their, their tone of voice when they write, whatever type of writing they're doing. Any bits of advice that you would share around that? Um, so I guess, well, to take the two things we've been talking about, actually, like take a constraint, um, and write every day. Uh, I think that's the, the sort of the only way to find your voice is to write a lot. It's one of the, like every creative practice. Uh, by the time you feel like you've cracked it and you look back, you think if anyone had told me it was going to take me 10 years to sort this out, I would have never started. You know, these it's they're all practices. They're all practices. So you need a I think if you want to develop your writing skill, you need a writing practice. Uh, and that could be, I'm going to write a haiku a day, or that could be, I'm going to do my morning pages and journal every day. It could be, I'm going to write a weekly blog, whatever it is, but some form of regular heartbeat of using words to express yourself and to, to use your writing to find out what you think, actually, like there's, there's broadly sort of two, is this true? Two sort of books in the world, isn't it? There's books are written by people who have a, an expertise or a knowledge that they want to impart to people. And there are books that are sort of explorations of ideas where the writer doesn't know where they're going until they set off. Um, I think that second type is much more interesting. So to, writing to find out what you think. That is such a lovely way to think about the kind of the learning journey of the writer, that the, the act of writing is the learning to learn 
and work out what you think. I love that. Um, and then I think my final question is around the advice that you would give to yourself looking back <laughs> to the maybe the nine year old Nick doing comics. If there was something that you could kind of say to that to that nine year old that you wish you'd known then, what would it be? Um, everybody's faking it. <laughs> just, just, just go for it. It's a weird one, that isn't it? Because on the one hand, I would want to say, you know, just go for it much more directly. Um, and yet at the same time, the indirect, circuitous, weird, serendipitous way my life has turned out has has been a total joy. So um, my nine year old self wouldn't listen to me anyway, and quite rightly so. <laughs> That's lovely. Nick, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed the conversation. And I know from some of the chat that's been going on that the audience has really enjoyed it as well. Um, thank you for being so generous with your time and your insights and, and your learning. And it really feels like um, you've shared a lot with us. So thank you so much. And thank you to Not everybody who has tuned in as well tonight. It's been great to have you here. Um, and a reminder that you can watch this session, uh, this conversation shortly up on the DNAD website and our other Still Learning Live conversations. And the final conversation in the series is going to be with graphic designer Pali Palavathanan, and that is on April the 27th. And Pali will be talking to us about being a graphic designer in an unusual context, um, working among others at the UN um, and looking at how graphic design can serve something other than just selling. So an interesting conversation to join then and a lot to live up to after this evening. So thank you so much again, Nick. Really enjoyed it. Not and at all. It's hope, a total pleasure. Uh, hope thank to see much. and read your words again soon. Thank you. Thanks everyone. I hope that was useful. Take care.